Welcome to the ICG's Digital Academy webinar series. I'm Naomi Gubler, responsible for running the ICG's webinar program. Today's webinar, The Nuts and Bolts of Researching Kids and Teens, will be presented by Nikki Correct, our fellow ICG member and the founder of Sherbet Research. Just for those who aren't members or who aren't familiar with the ICG, the ICG is a hub of nearly 450 independent market researchers within the UK and abroad. We collaborate and share knowledge and experience for the benefit of members, clients and advertisers. So if you're a client or agency, you can find your perfect consultant or team of consultants through us. If you're a freelancer and small business, you can join us. And if you're a supplier, you can advertise with us. Our sponsor for today's webinar is Maru Blue. Maru Blue are a full service research agency who have online communities in the UK, US and Canada, working with trusted partners in all other markets. Each community is extensively screened, meaning access to hard to reach participants is easier. Their ethos is quality over quantity, giving them highly engaged participants and therefore higher response rates. They already have sub-communities based upon this profiling, meaning they can offer a wide range of niche and hard to reach targets more easily and more cost effectively. They also have a four pronged approach where they're available as a full service agency an assisted serve can run a 24 hour omnibus or available for sample only. Please remember our webinars, webinars qualify for MRS CPD certification. Each webinar is worth one CPD hour. So remember to ask for it if you need one after the session. Just send an email to cpd at the icg.co.uk. You're able to ask any questions by typing them into the chat box that you'll see on your screens. We'll ask a range of questions out midway through and again at the end of the session. If yours isn't answered, feel free to email us on the ad admin at the icg.co.uk with the question and we'll get it answered for you afterwards. If you wish to tweet about this webinar, please do so copying, copying in at the ICG. Two dates for your diaries. We have our next webinar on the 5th of September, making the most of Trello. Please note the slightly later start time of 11.30 a.m. For ICG members, the AGM will be held on the evening of Thursday the 19th of September in a central London location. This will be followed by a ticketed event which anyone is able to attend, the ABC of LinkedIn, how to grow your marketing research business. I'm going to hand over now our speaker for today, Nikki Corret of Sherbet Research. Nikki will briefly introduce herself, so handing over to her now. Hi everyone. Um, so thanks Naomi, it's Nikki here. I'm gonna be running this webinar. Um, I'll spend the first 15 minutes and then we'll stop for some questions and then I'll have another 15 minutes. So let me tell you a little bit about Sherbet and myself. So, um, th sorry, this is what we'll be discussing. So a little bit about me and then we're gonna go through um, facts about the different ages when working with children and teenagers, some things that, and factors that influence their behavior. And then I'm gonna hopefully give some good tips and ideas for you on methodology, samples design, recruitment, research environment, some tips for moderation, a few discussion guide tips, because I know there's a lot of you who are researchers already. And then if we hopefully have time, some exploring some of the many what ifs that happen when you research with kids and teens. So a little bit about Sherbet. So we are a specialist agency in um, specializing in the world of kids, teens, families, and um, others in their worlds and lives. Um, we're almost 16 years old now, and we dedicate our, our world, our, our research world and lives to uncovering the mysteries that lie within the, the world of kids, tweens, and teens. Um, and we're experienced in all areas. So we, because we're niche, we kind of work um, in any area within um, 
their world, including sport, food and drink. Uh, we work with loads of different media and educational companies and charity and government. Um, there's three of us in the team. We do have a, a, a lot of freelancers we work with, but there are three um, in the team at the moment, uh, two part-time and one full-time. Um, we have a website and anyone who wants to know the kind of clients that we work with, please let me know later. Um, so just a start point um, for those of you who've never done research with kids and teens, it is that whilst there's lots of similarities, there are it is different to grown up research. Um, and we believe, or I believe it, you know, that the that it's really important to, to get experience and to get training before you kind of embark on on the, uh, talking and working in in with, with kids and teenagers. Um, it can be quite a challenge sometimes to sort of uh, get um, them talking and to really understand what they what they're saying and versus what they mean with the, you know the differences between what they say versus what they mean particularly younger kids um, and also I think uh, groups of kids groups of teenagers can suss you out very quickly so they'll suss it out they'll suss you out if, if you're nervous or if you don't feel comfortable they're also uh, a very diverse and often vulnerable group. So, you know, being a skilled professional and working in, in this area it, it is incredibly important. It can be a real balancing act, as I'm sure you are probably aware, um, balancing the needs of clients with your needs and with the needs, the most important, the, the, the needs of, of the kids and the teenagers. And, and their, their um, well-being obviously is the most important and is paramount. So it's not always possible to achieve that balance. And the balance should always go with with the children, with the teenagers, and it's important to sort of uh, be upfront and honest and with the client about what can and can't be done, um, particularly in certain subject areas with kids um, uh, and, and teenagers in research. So just as a start point as well, um, <clears throat> there's some real benefits of doing research with kids and teenagers. The benefits are it's hugely rewarding. It can be so rich and insightful and energetic and challenging when you do groups and lots of fun. They are hugely entertaining most of the time. Um, and unpredictable comes on both sides here because sometimes the unpredictability can be really, really interesting and really uh, uh, a great part of researching with the kids and youth and as well as hugely insightful. But, but on the other side, there can be some challenges um, when you work with kids and teenagers. Uh, the younger kids in particular can be hugely unfocused and very loud. Sessions, depending on how many you have in a group, can be very chaotic. They can be cheeky. You and them can get quite confused. Um, we'll come on to this at the end with the, uh, the what ifs, but yeah, they can be really naughty in, in a way that obviously potentially most adult groups aren't very contradictory, which you nearly have to really work with when it comes to sort of analysing all your data. And again, the unpredictability, whilst it can be a really positive, it can be quite a challenge as well. Um, so it's always kind of, kind of balancing the, 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 the two things together. So let's have a really, really, really quick look at some of the main differences between um, the ages of of, of the kids that we speak to at share but we do kind of start from a very young age we don't speak um to the little ones on their own obviously um but when the, you know we have done research with the naught to threes obviously this is an age group that are hugely dominated by their senses they are still learning to speak the chances of under threes having a long conversation with you is a is minimal very <laughs> ecocentric a very highly tactile touching everything so it is it's hard to research this age group you know if you do it's generally through parents but it is possible at times to do research with the very little ones at around 18 months observational we've done work with them looking you know looking at um at tv shows and and, and observing um them watching it of the likes of peppa pig and such but the, any test material needs to be visual and physical and you have to kind of work out and and check that they're not reacting to you um, rather than the material you're showing and we would always always have a parent or an adult um, within at, at, with them and, and be, it would be in their environment so ideally at home uh, we have been to uh, preschools or nurseries as well um, to do research with this age group 
the three to sixes. So a few little um, things about their development. They're developing their theory of mind. They're quite pre-logical. So pretty much they're the age where anything can happen. You can you can have some wonderful discussions about uh, you know innate objects coming alive or saw uh, a, a pen being a sword or they kind of believe everything can anything. Uh, very much learning their social skills. It's the beginning of school in the middle of this age group for, for kids in the UK. They are beginning to really use their language to learn to read and write, very black and white thinkers, quite impulsive and self-centered. For research terms, we'll come on to it, but very, very short tension spans, probably around five or 10 minutes at a time sometimes. Um, a time of regression, a lot of kids starting school, very tired, learning a lot, often kind of uh, regressing back to toddler moments, particularly at the top end of that age group um, can happen quite a bit. Um, but every day is filled with new experiences. It's a very exciting time to be a child. Um, Research-wise, again, things need to be highly visual. It's really great, if relevant, to tap into their fantasy and creative minds um, through role play. <clears throat> but again, interviewing them, important to be in a familiar and sort of surrounding, whether it be a home or, or um, a school setting, if relevant. Still, we still tend to have, <clears throat> sorry, an adult around um, uh, because they're still quite young and sometimes they still need help to articulate, you know, through 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 um, the help of an adult. But it's very important this age group really to lay down ground rules as well. Or it can become hugely chaotic uh, and not in a good way. Then we move up to the 6 to 11s. I mean, often at Sherbert, we actually uh, break the age groups down into much more smaller groups than this. But for the sake of, of, of the length of this webinar, I put the 6 to 11s together. So this is what we call for most the latency phase of, of childhood. Uh, it's the kind of golden years of childhood, the, the sort of the calm before the storm, before puberty kicks in for most. Um, a lovely time again to be a child little um becoming slightly more concrete thinkers particularly towards the end of this age group and a bit more logical in their worlds with their friends it's fitting in is key they're beginning very the beginning to uh, form identities away from 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 adults and family but it's still not really until the teenagers that this happens they're quite impressionable boys and girls pretty much separate separated um in in when they play i mean there'll always be some who play together but generally they're separate the imaginative um play within their worlds really diminishes particularly by the time they reach 11. so life's much more about the real um rather than sort of the imagination and, and imaginative um animated kind of world right in the middle of this age group love collecting so if you meet an only eight or nine year olds around that age it's a, a real time for sort of collecting and showing their ownership and very proud of their of their collections um and the sort of the playground hierarchy and competition is quite uh, dominant particularly often for some of the boys but again there'll be some girls in there too in terms of research language and memory really improving by this point although you know when it comes to research you've got to be quite careful with the language you use but they're more capable uh, of doing um more sort of standard types of research limited memory still though so they'll need that kind of stimulus often all the way through but definitely this age group and the next needing a friend alongside them and pre-tasks can be really helpful in um helping their memory to remember things particularly if you want them to recall stuff for you so getting to do something prior is is always a good idea if if appropriate and finally, the teenagers, um, or the 11, 12 year olds, much more uh, at this age looking for identity, more of an looking for their identity and desire for self-expression. They are swinging between childhood and becoming an adult. Hormones kick in, quite self-conscious. Friends are everything now, and approval from them is so important. Social media crazy, craving that freedom and independence and seeking sort of power over their lives now and wanting to be much more in control. So, you know, when it comes to research, they're much more capable of abstract thinking. They, you can have depth, in-depth conversations with this age group, <clears throat> pretty much like an adult, just need to be kind of careful again of the language, but they want to be treated like an adult. Um, and it's really important, we'll come on later, but not to try too hard with this age group. They really will, will see through it if, if you do. 
few quick things um, about um, appreciating, remembering, you know, that they're not all the same when it comes to research. It's, you know, in the world of kids and teens and, and generally, I guess, research, everyone, there's so many factors that will come into play as to how they will react or be um, within the research environment. So it's really important to remember that. And a few things to quickly think about, you know, you know, where they live will have an influence, who they live with will be an influence. We know these days, you know, that there's no <clears throat> in inverted commas normal type of family anymore. Who they hang out with as they get older in particular has a huge influence um, on, on, on their uh, attitudes um, and whether they'll conform or rebel and obviously, you know, what they're going to be like in general. And obviously, again, who and what they identify with. Um, it can be hugely different in one age group, the music, the fashion, who they are, their role models, what things they wear, what they game on, if they do game, the brands they're into, all of these things have a, a massive and huge impact on, on their, you know, what the kind of understanding you'll get from them. And, and, and you know, it, it's something that we spend a lot of time in analysis looking at to understand why the, the, there's differences in, in, in what they're saying. A very quick uh, whistle stop on the differences that we often see between boys and girls pretty much through the age groups potentially even to adults um, obviously uh, there'll always be 20% of the girls who are more like the boys and 20% of boys more like the girls but in general girls often better at kind of talking versus boys like to be able to do stuff they're quite supportive boys are more about achieving girls tend to have best friend the, the BFF as we know Boys often have a, uh, more about talking about their good friends and have a wider selection of good friends versus best friends. Girls can often be a little bit more manipulative and emotional. Boys a bit more confrontational, a bit more physical, um, and they're more activity focused. The girls and the girl, boys, I mean, and the girls often more socially adept than the boys. Not always the case, to be honest, but often we see this um, in research, particularly because we often do groups, you know, with the same ages, boys and girls, to to look at the differences. So all of these things can help you identify, you know, who you want to talk to, how and where to talk to them, asking the kind of rights and wrong questions. And we'll come into more detail in the next 15 minutes on all of this. Uh, and, and hopefully once you think about all these things, it can make sense of what they say and, and kind of also what they don't say. Um, I think I'm going to come on to ideas methodology. I don't know at this point, that's sort of a real, real whistle stop. Uh, into the world of, of, of kids and teenagers before we look at sort of the last 15 minutes and some of the ideas and taking you through the research process. So I'll hand over to Naomi for any quick questions at this point. Okay, so Nikki, we've got a question that's come in, which is what do you mean by kids and teens being a vulnerable group? Wow, okay. <laughs> um, they're, well, they're a hugely vulnerable group because you need to be, uh, aware of all the things I've just said so where they've come from their family background they're going to feel nervous uh, they are a group who often have come to research because their parents have sent them or they don't know what they're going to be talking about uh, they are you know a, a group of four-year-olds in a room you're in control of them their parents have handed them over to you you've just got to be really careful what you talk to them about and what the subjects are and how you talk to them about anything i mean we're doing a project right now on looking at obesity which is a hugely sensitive and potentially controversial area so we have to be so careful about how you know we talk to three-year-olds about weight and health and it, you have to be very careful that you don't start talking to them about things that they could then go off and could have a an impact on on, on, on what they do or don't know. So everything we do, we have to look at them as a, as a group that they're young and they're developing and, you know, yeah. building knowledge up. So we need to be really careful. We are researchers, we're finding out what they know. It's not, it's not our place to judge them or to give them information that they didn't know before. So yeah. it's always about coming from their agenda. So, I mean, it, it, that's a massive, massive question. I hope it <laughs> went somewhere in answering it. Um, another question has come in, which is another big question, actually. Is the rise of gender awareness impacting your research? Uh, we're looking at that now, actually. Um, uh, uh, we do an ongoing tracker called Scoop, and we're looking at diversity. Um, it, yes and no. I think with the kids under sort of 11 and 12, no. 
Um, it also will depend on um, the research, what area we're looking at, what we're talking about. So day to day, we actually know, but when we talk about diversity, I and mean, when we talk about specifically about gender and identity or the differences between the genders, if that's part of a project, mm -hmm. then, then it, it's something that we are trying to be more mindful of. Um, and, but again, we lead from, from the children themselves. So it, it hasn't really become up as, an, as something that we need to think about in recruitment or doing sessions yet, but it is, it's something that we're very aware of and, um, you know, sort of beginning to think about if, if, if there might be different ways of doing things in the future. Yeah. Um, can I ask, do you have a preference between um, hosting focus groups with children in facility or versus the old school recruiter home scenario yeah. is there a is there a difference for you in terms of feeling i think again it depends on what the project's about so more social research i'd always want to be in the kids own home my preference would always be to talk to kids in either a friend's house or their home um my next preference would be a recruiter's home but recruiters will come onto this who have a home that's welcoming to kids um and then my last preference would be, would be then again viewing facilities which a lot of the really good ones sadly seem to be closing down the, the good ones for kids that is and teenagers um, and hotels would be my last resort um but i have done research in in hotels i just they're just not that uh, uh, um kid or team friendly we're coming on to sort of uh, i've got a little section on on venues and the places for for, for where okay. to do with them okay, we've well, got um We've got a couple, Naomi, um, as well. This is Lucy just come through saying, oh. um, you mentioned special training for working with kids and teens. What yeah. training would you recommend or should we leave it to the professionals? <laughs> well, this this webinar I'm doing years ago used to be I used to I used to run the MRS course and I sadly um, uh, for lots of reasons that doesn't happen. I mean, if you love working with kids and if you believe you have a the skill to working with kids then i'm happy to train you and <laughs> um, i i think lots of people find it very difficult it's not it it requires a certain amount of skill and an almost like uh you just want to you want you need to want to, to um, be happy to sit in a room with lots of children and for that to be something that excites you rather than puts the fear of God into you. So I would say generally, you know, I'm just doing some work right now for a fashion brand who were like, we don't want, we don't know how to talk to kids. Um, can you do it? So I, I think if you want to and, and it excites you, then, you know, there are a few training courses, not many out there. I mean, my background is I was a teacher. So I, I, I think my training all came initially from that. And I did a lot of youth work as well. So, yeah, I mean, I either leave it to us, the professionals, or if you want to, I can help put people in, you know, in contact with some places where you can get some um, uh, training more than just this very short webinar. And one more, if you wouldn't mind nicking them. Um, do you think that they are more honest or direct or are they keen to say what they think you want to hear? And how does that vary by age and gender? Well, so, um, <laughs> very quick because there's not enough time, but uh, I think kids are unbelievably honest, um, more so than adults, because kids can't lie all the way through. I think by teenagers they can, but generally um, they don't lie, which is why we do uh, sessions with friends, because if they do lie, their friends normally ca catch them out and tell you that they that's not true. There are times when they'll that they'll want to react to you. Um, that's where the skill of being a good kid moderator comes in because you can usually tell. Um, you know, if someone says, "I love it, I love it, I love it," and then at the end you kind of come back to it and go, "You know, would well, you want to take it with you?" I've done research on toys where they go, "I love it, I love it," and at the end I'm like, "You can take the toy with you if you want." And they're like, "Ah, oh, no, not really." So you just have to play around with with the way you talk with them. Um, to work it out if they're reacting just to you to make you happy. But it doesn't happen very often because you just need to keep questioning and you need to look at body language and you need to ask the question in so many different ways so that you can fully understand, you know, wh what it is that they mean versus what they're saying, which is kind of one of the comments I made at the beginning that often what they say versus what they mean are two different things. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's this, uh, that's the skill, I guess um in, in being a kid researcher for 20 years that generally i i kind of know what they mean even if it's not what, they, what they've actually said if that makes sense mm -hmm. um is that all the qu questions that have come in lucy 
Yes, that's it. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So we've got about another 15 minutes. I'm going to whiz through the, the, the next sections. <laughs> so let's quick some of this. If I've now mentioned it in those questions, I'll just flick quicker. So the things to consider, um, every project we do at Sherba has a unique methodology. Often they can be uh, the same, but we always look at each project with the objectives, the age we believe they need to be spoken to, what the subject nature is, and how we're going to best engage the kids. So we really kind of consider this right before we write the proposal of what is the best way that we can do this with the age of the kids that we have and the objectives. Um, so these are the types of methodologies we use at Sherbert. Uh, I mean, the, main, the, the ones, they're not obviously new methodologies, but we do, where possible and appropriate, we'll do hangouts in, in a child's bedroom if we're allowed. Obviously, some parents aren't, are, 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 can be nervous of that, but we often just chat with them first or start off downstairs. But what, doing friendships with three friends or four friends or two friends in, someone, in their bedroom with all the stimulus of their own worlds around them is, is probably one of the my favorite ways of doing research. We often do simultaneous family sessions where we'll have um, the parents and the kids together in a room and the kids go off to speak to one moderator and the parents to another. That's also a really lovely way of sort of seeing the similarities and differences. A great way for clients as well, it's quite dynamic. Moderatorless, something we've been doing a lot. I don't think many people do them because they are a logistical, logistical nightmare, but they are hugely insightful where you basically leave a camera running and kids run the session without you there. Um, works brilliantly with kids, less so with adults, because kids, you get to see the peer dynamic there of, who, of who's in charge, whereas when adults do it, often you just get a very bad moderator. But uh, a really, really great way to work alongside um, more traditional methodologies to find out how kids speak about sometimes more sensitive issues um, without an adult in the room. Obviously, accompanied shops are a great um, methodology, particularly for the sort of 11 and 12 pluses who are out shopping on their own. And then you've got the more traditional um, types of methodologies with workshops and just more traditional focus groups, online blogs and diaries for the kids that can actually type. It's not really until about 11 or 12 that they are that good at it. So always remember that. Ethnographic explorations. We've just done a massive project recently, which has been lovely to spend time with kids in their, in their homes and their worlds and friendship pairs and triads as well. Uh, just a quick thing on sample structure. So we do all our research by year group at Sherbert because there's a massive difference between a child who is eight in year four versus a child who is 10 in year five, only one school year apart, but huge differences. So we tend to do it this way, most if not all the time. You can skip an age group if budgets are tight, but you know if you're if you're wanting to speak to kids between four and twelve, there's going to be quite a lot of groups. Ideally, you know, a minimum of five, if not more groups, to kind of cover all all the different age groups there. If you if you put you know year four with a year five, year year six, chances are that year four child or children, unless they are hugely hugely confident, tend to don't tend to not speak very much, and it's dominated by the older child. We get asked this a lot, you know, how long can you make sessions? Well, actually you can make them as long as you want to, but you've got to keep them interested and motivated um, more so than adults, but also, you know, it's quite similar in, in the same way, but you've got to consider things like, you know, when are you going to bring in the stimulus or what stimulus? Have you pre-placed? A parent's going to be involved at all. If you're going to film, you know, when are you going to do that type of things? Kids are always going to be hungry. They're always going to want um, snacks at some point. But the really basic things like if you give kids a packet of crisps, chances are if someone's trying to watch or you're recording, you won't hear a word that anyone's saying. Um, fizzy drinks can get send kids crazy. Um, and so all, same as sweets and e-numbers. Um, and I've had, I, what, what this webinar doesn't have is a time for me to give you examples of, of, of all these things that have gone wrong in the 20 years that I've been doing research. Um, but yes, eating the food yourself is it, it, it's not a great thing. There's choking or, or not actually being able to speak as well. But as long as you've kind of thought of all these things, generally an hour and a half group, even with the little ones, as long as you have a, you know, as long as you, as long as they are with you, you don't necessarily need to have a break. Um, even with the sort of five and sixes, you can go for about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, if if you got if they're interested in what you're talking about, um, it, but generally, so we do groups for about an hour, an hour and a half. If we do two hour groups, chances are we'll have a break in the middle. Um, 
to, 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 so, so that they can have something to eat or, or often just go to the toilet. Recruitment wise, we use uh, child friendly recruiters. Ideally, I mean, and most of ours are DBS checked. They obviously now need to be GDPR compliant. We get written consent from always from the parent for under 16s because you have to, but we do anyway for actually under 18s. Um, and we get consent on certain sub pro projects from the kids, written consent from the kids as well. Um, but we always make sure at the beginning of the group, the kids are happy to be there. Really important at the recruitment that their recruiter speaks to the kids as well, because you'd be amazed or not that some parents think their child's in year three, but actually when you get there, they forgot that they actually were now in year four. So if you spoke to the child prior, then they would have told you that. So it's just re make sure that, 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 that they, you know, have been um, spoken to as well to check that they are, and are into what they say they are. So we recruit friends because it's more relaxed and it's a more natural conversation. And like I said before, more likely to tell the truth. Um, we do tend to keep boys and girls separate um, because they're very different. They have different views. Um, but we do sometimes put them together, particularly in, if it's in school or often we do workshops when boys and girls come together, but we will split off like uh, school year, as I said before, and social class are often less relevant. Sometimes if the client wants us to, obviously we will, but often, the way we recruit is through attitudinal statements, which seems to generally be more effective than what social grade they're from. So recruitment, it's the same, you know, as adult recruitment, but obviously, again, always thinking all the way through with kids research, the language you're going to use. So if there's questions for the kids, just make sure they're simple. Use examples, visual ones if you can, um, to check they, they understand. So if you want them to have drunk a certain brand of drink or watch a certain TV show, you need to have a visual picture of it because you'll be amazed. They'll say, yeah, 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 I've watched that and then realize that they haven't or, or vice versa. You know, so they, they, they think they haven't watched it and then they see a picture and then they realize they have. Um, they're not, kids and teens aren't likely to lie. So uh, it, it's really important to make sure that you've spoken or had some kind of uh, discussion to check to a check back recruitment before you meet them. Often if you get some kids in a group who um, aren't recruited, have, aren't on spec, it's because their parents potentially have lied on their behalf. We get that quite a lot, sadly. So also though, Parents whose kids haven't done research, it's really important to be honest and open and reassure them because they can't. I'm, ha I'm having it at the moment with some groups we're recruiting. Someone they're very nervous that we're filming. They want to know why and what we're going to show it for and where's it going to be and how long we're going to keep it for. So obviously we have all those answers. Um, and the best way for I, I always end up just talking to the parent directly because I think I can really put them at ease. But if not, we have all the right consent forms. And there's always an option to say no, you know, if they really are that worried that, you know, at the end of the day, if they're too worried that their children probably shouldn't be taking part. But 99.9% of the time, it's just the reassurance that they want because they, as back to the vulnerable side of things, they are giving you their kids, out, giving you their kids and they trust that you're going to, you know, look after them and talk to them about things that are appropriate for their age range uh, and they trust you. So, and they want, you want them to be able to trust you. So that's of huge importance. Best time to do research? Well, the best time is probably weekends and, and holidays, but that's not always very client friendly or, 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 or researcher friendly. But we have we have done research um, in the holidays. That's partly because the kids and weekends, you know, the kids are less tired. But the majority happen after school. Um, we don't tend to go past well, 8, 8.30 with teenagers or 7, 7.30 with the sort of the under 11s. Um, again, you can kind of do them. We tend to start at around 334 depending on the area we're going to when they finish school um we do make sure kids aren't in school uniform so they need to be able to kind of quickly get changed so you know four o'clock is normally the right uh the right time to start I, I, i've been running this kind of uh like i say for nearly 20 years every time i update this which is every six months to a year the, the incentives go up um it can depend on what you're doing in the research but these are the types of amounts that we are giving um for an hour and a half to two hour groups at the moment. They need rewarding for pre-tasks. Obviously you can't reward with merchandise, which is quite frustrating sometimes in kids research because if you're doing a brilliant project for Lego and you, you know the kids would probably prefer um, a, a box of Lego, but we can't. So it's usually money or Amazon vouchers um, that we um, incentivize with. A little bit we've talked about this, but it's important in the research environment to create a friendly, secure place. Um, think about where the toilets are, where's everyone going to sit? 
night hotels are a bit of a nightmare sometimes because there's no toilets nearby lots of big corridors for kids to run down so it's always just like really important when you choose a venue to, to, to kind of think about the age of the kids where's everyone going to be how's it going to work and try and do that all before, before you get there i kind of put a toolkit here because this is this is what research does is it just builds your toolkit because the tricks and tips and ways of speaking to kids is about creating a toolkit of different ways every group I do I have like about 20 different ways of starting or I spend the first five or ten minutes kind of really trying to suss out what's this group like are they quiet are they noisy are they confident are they frightened all those types of things and then I pick out from my toolbox the way I'm going to start the group because it's very important to start to start right in any group even more so with kids setting the boundaries if they're really naughty it's about setting the boundaries early on if they're nervous and you tell them those types of things later you know starting the work the, the discussion from their agenda finding out as much as you can about them making sure the chatter boxes are or you find out who they are and bringing in those kids that are a little bit more quieter but everyone should be involved really soon on otherwise the, you know, the, the shyer kids often will just not come out of their shells introductions are key um like i say there's different ways of doing it um have lots of different ways up your sleeve um depending on, on on you know the types of kids or the environment you're in and what feels right you know different icebreakers different name games sometimes it's just what's your favorite there's lots of different ways um, of, of starting it up but it's for that first five ten minutes is a time to ensure they feel um, secure and create environment an environment that they're going to feel happy to speak in and then some few some few tips be honest treat them with respect. Don't try and be their friend, but be friendly. And I always say, I, I don't want to come across as a teacher. Sometimes because I was, I can if they're, but generally it's a, meant to be fun and it's meant to be a time for them to tell you that kids love giving you, kids and teenagers love someone who's there in front of them wanting to listen and hearing their opinion. So be careful of judgments. I've got lots of stories from my early days of, of, of situations I got myself into when I was by accident judgmental so i really learned you know it's very important to just listen not to not to give advice um and on the flip side be really careful but don't don't be scared don't rush in kids often don't speak as much as adults so it's quite it, you, you kind of feel like you almost want to kind of dive in quicker because they they don't speak in the same way but sometimes it's important not to to allow them the space to speak don't try and be like them. I mean, I love football, so kids don't mind it when I join in the conversation. But if I didn't, I probably I wouldn't. Um, if you ask kids, do you like something? And there's a yes, no answer, even more than adults, they'll say yes or no. And that can be the end of the conversation. So it's really important to use words like tell me a story or tell me about or those types of things. But don't be afraid of silences and kind of assume anything. If you kind of do all those things, chances are you're, 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 it will be uh, a, a better experience for, for both of for you and and for them i i didn't have time to do but just the discussion stuff i know we're kind of running out of time but the few discussion points the way that i've always written discussion guides is to write it in the language that i'm going to use so i already have kind of gone through the thought process it can really help if you think about the language because often when you speak to kids in particular the under 10s if they're looking at you in a weird way it's probably something you said they're very literal they can take what you say very literally um, and sometimes you realize it's the words you've used that, that they have misunderstood so you just have to if you've written it a guide prior um, and thought about the language it will really help really more so the kids than even with and again it's the same with adults but more so with kids and teens be prepared to come off guide and don't use them as a script stimulus i've mentioned this you just have to have enough but not too much <laughs> But it's, I, you know, the, the direct and indirect work well with, with kids and teenagers. They mood boards and expressions and personification and things like that can tend to be brilliant. They can also fall flat, but kids are very good at using their creative brains and minds. But it's really important, and we work really closely with um, clients and stimulus to make sure it's appropriate and right for the age groups. And that leaves me which was what i got like a minute i think these are all the what ifs these are all the things i mean maybe we'll leave it to the questions you can ask there's all sort of little answers i'm not going to be able to, to answer all of them um but here's some what ifs on the page i can leave them up and then if anyone wants me to answer i guess it's at least five minutes for questions i can answer i've got some uh 
answers to these what ifs that I can give people um, answers to. So shall I hand back to Naomi? We've got, I think, five minutes for questions. Okay, so I've got a question for you here. It's how do you manage working outside of the UK if you do, um, both from a practical point of view and also addressing differences in approaches to child rearing? Uh, yep, so we do a lot of international research. Um, it's it, again, it will always be dependent on the project um, and the countries that you're going to. But uh, if I'm in charge, if I'm coordinating the project, I've got a really amazing partners all over the world, some that I've got from the ICG. Um, and we as a team, we sit and we chat and I will tell them what the methodology is, what the objectives are, how we're working the project here in the UK and how can we adapt it for their country so in places like um, sort of uh, like Germany is one place they, they very rarely do in homes they're very nervous of it so sometimes we have to do it in facility we have to adapt dependent on, on the country we're working in um, the same in, in Mexico and Brazil we did some projects recently um, and they we had to do them in venues whereas in the UK we did them in home Australia was very similar to the UK. It's really speaking to the partners that you're working with and um, asking them, you know, showing them the methodology, say, what can you do? And if you can't, what's your, what's the best way to, to do it as close as we can to, to what we're doing, but taking into account the different cultures and the different, you know, um, different way that different countries are when it comes to research, but cultures as well. Um, so Somebody would like to know, what do you do if they all stop talking? <laughs> I had this one two days ago. Um, <laughs> ugh, it's really, you know what, that's probably one of the hardest ones. And um, uh, two days ago, I had three 14 year old boys who weren't good friends. Uh, they were all really tired and they literally weren't talking to me. So I turned off the recording. I turned off I, I, and I just basically had a long chat with them. And I said, look, you know, I'm here for an hour and a half. You look like you don't want to talk to me, but I really want to talk to you. Let me, I, I gave them the choice actually to, to stop the group. I, I said, you know, you know, and I wasn't not going to give them the money to be honest. I said like, let's split it. Cause they were getting a lot of money. I said, I'm really happy to go. What do you want me to do? What, what would make you feel more comfortable? Um, we came off the topic. So the topic obviously wasn't that interesting for them, I think. So, and I, they were, luckily I was in their house. So I let them play a game of um, FIFA, which they said they loved. Um, and, and I know it got better. Um, it wasn't the best group. Sometimes it just happens, but it can be to do with what you're talking about. So I always kind of test the water to see, is it me? Occasionally, you know, sometimes it, you just don't gel with the group. Um, and I think that was partly what happened a few days ago, but, or, or is it also like sometimes, I, it, no disrespect to working on um, FMCG brands like cheese, but sometimes if you're talking to a group of nine or 10 year old boys on something like cheese, there's only a certain amount of time that they'll talk about it for. So come off subject, check whether it's, you know, what is it, why are they not talking and, and try and work it out. Um, uh, it's just a matter of elimination, I guess. And, and sometimes knowing that occasionally they, you can't get them talking, but most of the time I do. Um, another question has come in. After 20 years of working with kids and teens, what are the biggest challenges you still encounter? Ah, probably that actually. You know, it's interesting that happened to me two days ago. I, I, I absolutely love it. The, the job that I do, I'm so lucky. I, I love almost every minute. A, a group of, of kids who have obviously don't want to be there, it, it is, is a challenge. Recruitment is a challenge sometimes, you know, getting the right kids. Um, because when you do and when the kids are on spec, it's amazing. But sometimes, you know, you can get into a room and think the kids are wrong or they're the wrong age or all those things I said, they're the wrong age or they have been recruited not to like something what they should have done. But I think that's always a challenge. Um, but I, 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 I feel really lucky because I found the job that's so perfect for the skills that I have. And generally, there's very... You know, the, 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 I've got more highlights, I think, than challenges. That's great. And the last one, I think, is would you tend to run mini groups or larger? And how many in a typical group? Oh, yeah, I thought I might have written that. Um, always, so the only, if never more than four would be my ideal. Four, three to four friends is perfect. 
but there are some clients who want bigger groups. So if we have bigger groups, we'll have I'll have more moderators. So we did some big research recently for a serial company where we had, I think, 16 kids in the room, but they were in groups of fours. We had four moderators. Um, I think, uh, depending on what you look, I have done like very large groups for TV companies where we've watched um, a pilot of a new TV show, of like 20 kids in a room. So I, I, I can talk to 20 or 30 kids, you know, well not talk, but have a group of 20 or 30 kids in one room, like a class, but I'd never have more than four, ideally four, possibly six uh, at, at, at the very end in a group. If you have more than six, people won't talk. But, and to have six, you're going to have to have friendship pairs there. Um, so I would never do that with teenagers. You never want to mix teenagers who don't know each other. I did it last year. Um, I worked for the Telegraph, tele and, and they put they they recruited for me. I had, I think, eight teenagers in a room who all didn't know each other. But that was a challenge. There you go. That was a huge challenge. Boys, girls, all different ages, all didn't know each other in one room. It was It, it was fine. It just wasn't very nice for them. It really wasn't very nice for them. They it took me probably about forty five minutes to warm them up, so I, I wouldn't potentially do that. <laughs> it's not nice for for them more than for you almost. That's great. Thank you so much, Nikki, for today. Mm -hmm. um, the slides will be out with everybody soon. Um, if there are any questions that anyone comes up with after the session that they'd like answered, they send them along to admin at the icg code at icg sorry code uk. Um, we will get those answered for you. Um, and um, just a reminder of the next webinar session, which is Thursday, the 5th of September at 11.30 a.m., making the most of Trello. Thanks again, Nikki. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.